the inherent conflict of Jacob's life continues with his sons. The Joseph story is seen as a novella or a short story because of its continuity of narrative with a succession of acts or scenes. It has the themes of the younger ruling the older and the one fallen into adversity who makes good. There is not much here about God's direct inter intervention except in dreams. The work of God is going forward, but it is more hidden. There are no place names in, uh, re in, uh, for Egypt, and we never learn the name of Pharaoh, but the account is heavy with the customs and practices of the Egyptians. We see favoritism, which began with Isaac and Rebekah, spying on one's siblings, sibling rivalry, and a young ego in Joseph. To the theme of blessing and conflict is added downfall and restoration. And throughout this, the work of God and the promise still going on. In a previous lecture, I talked about the fact that the past is never really over. It has long shadows. And much of what happens in the Joseph story is a result of seeds sown in the lives of Laban, Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. For example, the trickery of Laban in substituting Leah for Rachel as a wife for Jacob has terrible consequences. Jacob's open preference for Rachel and disregard for Leah has consequences. The competition between Leah and Rachel to bear sons to Jacob has consequences. And yet, we need to ponder how does God work with all of that? How does he redeem those situations? So in that competition between Leah and Rachel, which sets up the story of Joseph, after the two women are given as wives to Jacob, Rachel is childless. She is unable to bear a child. But the Lord opens Leah's womb, and she has four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Rachel is jealous about this, and conflict arises between her and Jacob. In her sense of competitiveness, she gives her maidservant Bilhah to Jacob as a wife, and two sons are born sort of in Rachel's name, Dan and Naphtali. Leah at this point is barren and gives her maidservant Zilpah as a wife to Jacob and two sons are born, Gad and Asher. Leah hires Jacob and two more sons and a daughter are born, Issachar, Zebulun, and Dinah. And finally, God remembers Rachel and a son is born to her. Joseph. Jacob's favoritism is such that even in his preparations to meet Esau, he arranges his family and goods based on his preference and love for Rachel, so that Rachel and Joseph are in the most protected position. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. Jacob shows open favoritism regarding Joseph, setting up the conditions for rivalry in chapter 20, uh, 37. Note that chapter 37 begins with these are the generations, the Toledot of, marking a major section and focus. As we go on, note that the translation of Joseph's coat is rather uncertain. Traditionally, it was the coat of many colors. There's even a Broadway musical based on this, but probably it is, it is some kind of garment that is a mark of luxury and lordship, probably long with long sleeves, as it is later mentioned as a garment of royal princesses. It's a garment that would not be 
easy for people to work in if they were working in the fields. Here it is dreams that are the vehicles of divine communication, as in the book of Daniel. There is less of God speaking directly to people. Dreams come in pairs to emphasize importance, and the dream acts as an oracle, a foretelling of the future. In the story of the selling of Joseph into slavery, there are two groups me mentioned, the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. It is unclear why these two groups, uh, perhaps the Ishmaelites are seen first and the Midian Midianites get there first. Some have suggested uh, two different traditions. Now, Joseph, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. And because Joseph shares his dreams and brings a bad report of the brothers, the brothers determined first to kill Joseph. But Reuben prevents this with an intent to rescue Joseph, and Joseph is thrown into a cistern instead. It is possible that the brothers sort of are thinking, we'll just leave him here to starve to death or die of thirst. We don't want to actually spill his blood. We will just leave him here to die. Judah, and I put Judah in bold here, pay attention to this, it will be important, with an eye to gain, suggests selling Joseph into slavery. A report of Joseph's death then is brought back to Jacob, and Jacob goes into perpetual mourning. The story of Judah and Tamar in chapter 36 Eight is sometimes considered by modern commentators to be an insertion because it seems to interrupt the narrative of Joseph. However, and I credit Alistair Roberts with this observation, this insertion is incredibly important to the sequence of the story because as Joseph goes down into slavery, Judah's life spirals down, Judah as the one who suggests the selling into slavery. And it goes down increasingly into death. First of all, Judah marries a Canaanite woman, which would have been, in Israelite practice, not a good idea. Because it would have meant sort of going outside the community. Two of Judah's sons die, both having been married to Tamar. So his line, his future, is going down into death. And his sons are described as being wicked. Judah fears that Tamar is responsible for the death of his sons. I would note here that marrying Tamar to the second son after the death of the first reflects the practice of leveret marriage, which we see in Deuteronomy and in Ruth. This is intended to preserve the name of the dead man and his property. Tamar understands that Judah means to get rid of her permanently, and so she covers herself and sits by the side of the road where Judah takes her to be a prostitute. This, again, is a sign of Judah going down and spiraling down. And even worse, when asked for some kind of payment, he gives Tamar his cylinder seal, cord, and staff as surety. And these are not trivial items. These represent his identity and his office and his rule. It is sort of the equivalent of Esau selling his birthright for a bowl of stew. Judah is giving away 
his, uh, his vocation, basically, for a little bit of sex. However, and this is the mysterious work of God, Tamar's desperate action essentially halts Judah's descent into death because the two sons born to Tamar are the heads of two lines of the tribe of Judah. Judah's reclamation and redemption does not quite come here, but this is one step along the way, and it is one of those sort of mysterious ways in which God works.